Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining today. As always, it's so good to see your face here. If you're new here, welcome. If you haven't already dropped a little hello in the chat, let us know where you are coming in from. And welcome to this amazing space where we meet every single week at 1 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays to talk to interesting founders, leaders, all about what works in their life. You might have noticed there was a new intro. I would love your thoughts. I'm really curious about what you thought of it. I kept the music in, but I thought it was really cool. And so would love your thoughts on that. I also wanted to say a very happy birthday to Jeff. If you haven't already, say happy birthday to Jeff in the comments. Um, I know he has to leave a little early today, so that means we are on our own to find our own links because Jeff always puts in the links before anybody has the chance. So we are on our own on links today. I know Shelby from my team will try to be quick on the draw, on the helpful links, but if you beat us to it, it's anybody's game over there in the chat. So if you're new here, welcome. This is an interactive conversation. What does that mean? That means we are not going to lecture at you for 45 minutes. It means you have a seat at this table too. If you have a question, if you have a thought, if you have a comment, that's what the chat's for. Bring it up. We're going to bring you up. We have an amazing person that I think you are going to learn a whole lot from today. So I'm excited to see you, Roger and Elizabeth and Mike and Jose and Kelly and Heather and Jen. If you have questions, if you have comments as we're going, boom, 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 drop them straight in the chat. I'm super excited about our guest today because when I heard his title and the title of his podcast and sort of his ethos around work, I was like, oh, I need that. Uh, because Brandon Smith is all about workplace therapy. He's a workplace therapist. So he's teaching people how to be better leaders, how to communicate better as a team, and really how to step up. In addition to that, he is a podcast host. He is a recent author, which I can't wait to dive in with him about and just kind of get his thoughts a little bit more on that. But again, if you have questions around leadership, workplace culture, Congratulations, my friend, you are in the right place because Brandon today is going to drop a whole lot of knowledge. So please raise your cup, whatever it is you're drinking, and help me in welcoming Brandon to the show with us. Hey, Kim. How are you? How's it going, Brandon? It's going really well, although it's a little rainy here. I told Shelby, I'm like, of course, of course the weather says exactly for the next hour we'll have some rain, but I don't think that's well, going to ruin our conversation. It's not, and you know what comes at the end of the rain? A rainbow. A rainbow. So a, rainbow. a good a good day is yet ahead. Well, I'm really excited to have you here. Like I said, everybody hopefully did their Google stalking of you before this. Uh, but I'm super excited to get into one of my favorite topics of therapy and and leadership <laughs> in the workplace. And so I'm so curious. You know, you've done so much in your career and for anybody that doesn't know, you know, I feel like your, your kind of starter story is that you had a really bad boss, which I feel is so relatable. And I love the story that you actually had to fire someone on your first day of work. And so I'm curious, was that the spark where you were like, man, we need some yeah. change in the workplace? Yeah. So, so, I'll, so I'll tell the story to everybody who's listening. So I, yeah, I graduate from college. I have a communications degree. And like most good communication majors, I was unemployed at graduation, like wondering, what am I going to do with this thing? So I get a job at this chain of retail stores. And my boss is the son-in-law of the owner of the business. So the woman who started the business, her, her daughter marries this guy. He's my boss. So he greets me at the store where I'm going to be working. And I'm being an assistant manager there. And he says, I'm really glad to have you here. But before you get started, your first task is to go in the back room and waiting for you is the current assistant manager, but he doesn't know you're coming, which is not good. And, and he says, okay, so you got to go back there and fire him and you get his job. And, and, and that was what I had to do. So that's, so imagine your first task on your first real day of work that you had to go fire somebody. And, and, and for the first six months of that job, I did more layoffs than any other time in my career. So he did everything that we have now learned as leaders you shouldn't do. He loved surprise visits. He loved to try and catch you doing something wrong. So he, he, was, he would jump into the store when you didn't know he was coming in, and he'd take me in the back room. And he'd say, I don't like what Sharon's wearing. Go fire her. 
And so it was during that time that it really kind of woke me up, made me realize a couple things, which will be great for our conversation today. First, it made me realize um, work should not have to suck. It, 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 it should not be a source of anxiety and stress and depression. I mean, it is work. I mean, I get that. I'm not unrealistic to that. But, but it should be more like fulfillment and purpose and meaning and because we spend the majority of our waking lives at work. So it should be a good thing. Um, second, if my boss was any indication of the state of leadership in the world, I was like, wow, I, I, I kind of want to fix that. Um, and that was really where my third, that was where my purpose was born. You know, I, I wanted to eliminate all workplace dysfunction everywhere forever, having no idea what I signed up for. So that, that really, that really started my journey. And, and let me just say like, that is a tall order. Cause I think, in fact, I will, I will ask everybody, I'll, I'll even volunteer drop, drop a yes, or maybe a thumbs up in the chat. If you have had a bad boss, I, mm. I will be the first one in my career. I have definitely had bad bosses of people where I leave and I'm like, Ah, oh, they are the worst. You yeah. know, you talk about it over happy hour with friends or fellow coworkers, like, oh, this person's driving me crazy. And one of the biggest questions I had for you is to me, it's also a question in like self-awareness. Because yeah. I would always wonder, do they know that they're a bad boss? Or do they just kind of blissfully go about their day having no idea that they're terrible? So, okay, so let's take the idea of bad boss and, and, and put them on a spectrum. I think on the spectrum, there is um, blissfully unaware, which is on one side. And then the other side of the spectrum is like, don't care. Like, that's just like the narcissist, right? That's like, it's really, you're just, you're in my world and you should be happy to be there. Uh, which we've all probably encountered people like that before and hopefully they're not our, they're not our bosses. Uh, but I think the blissfully unaware, I think their intentions are typically okay in that they're they're trying to do the good thing, the right thing, and they're probably thinking to themselves, they're probably trying to follow the golden rule. I, I'm gonna treat this person the way I would want to be treated. You know, I like to be someone to be really direct with me and just hit me over the head with feedback. So I'm gonna hit this person over the head with feedback. Where they should probably be practicing the platinum rule, treat other people the way they they need to be treated, not necessarily the way you want to be treated. So I, I think you kind of look look on that spectrum, but oh yeah. There's a lot of not so good bosses out there. There, that is huge, and and the platinum rule almost reminds me of if not to get in a relationship talk, uh, but if anyone has read the five love languages, you know we all kind of speak these different languages of what of what we want to be treated like or what we need to be treated like, and so the platinum rule reminds me of that. And it, you're right, there is such a difference. So I'm curious if there are some people in this room who either are leaders. Or maybe I know Nisa just said um, that they're currently looking for a job. So if they're going to be looking for leaders and leadership positions, you know, how can you tell what somebody's going to be like? Or how can you tell what you're like? It, that must be kind of a hard task. Yeah. So you, you, you kind of shied away from this analogy of relationships. This is totally a relationship. It's a different kind of relationship, but it's totally a relationship. And 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 look, for Nisa, who's going to be doing, looking for a job and looking for a boss, that's totally dating. Like that is dating, absolutely dating. And if you marry too quick, you're going to regret that. So, and so, so just like on any date, you got to ask the right questions, right? Because you want to learn about the person, what are their values, what are their interests, what matters to them. So there are some sneaky ways you can do this. So if you're, um, so let me first give you a little framework. So when you're thinking about workplace happiness, okay, talk about rainbows. Um, workplace happiness is three things. It's right job, okay, the right skill sets for you, your your interests, your passions, right culture. You're so you're in a place where everyone shares the same values as you, okay. So you know you feel like you're at home, and then most importantly, right boss. Right boss is key. Right boss is actually more important than the other two because they can control your job and can control the, the culture of the team that you're on, right? If we're three out of three, a little rainbow pops up and follows us to work every single day. If we're two out of three, it's workplace satisfaction. It's okay. It's not horrible. I can make it work, but it's not perfect. One out of three, we're looking for another job. And if you've ever experienced zero out of three, like wrong job for you, Okay. Wrong culture. You think everyone thinks you're crazy. You think they're crazy too. And wrong boss, you know, your, your version of nightmare boss. It's like a little bit of your soul dies each and every day. Okay. 
So, so the key to the formula really is interviewing the right boss. So uh, I'll give you just a couple kind of great questions to ask. So you never want to ask someone you're interviewing a boss, like, what are your values? Because they'll say things like excellence, quality, caring. No. So instead, ask them, say, um, tell me about your favorite all-time rock star team member. What made her great or him great? And so they'll tell you things like, well, they worked all the time. I love that. Well, then you'll learn, well, this person wants me to work all the time. That's probably not a good fit for me, right? Uh, so you'll learn a lot about their values based on how they describe the person that was a rock star. And now you also need to ask the other side of the question. Tell me about the last time someone wasn't a good fit for your team. And maybe you had to invite them to leave or they left on their own. What, what made them not a good fit? Right? Well, they refused to work on the weekends. <laughs> okay, well, okay. They do learn a lot. So, so just asking kind of questions, getting them to tell stories, um, you'll you'll get, you'll tease out some of the values that you're really trying to find a, find a fit for. Uh, well, and I love that because I totally agree with you. I think it is definitely dating. I think you're trying to find a right match. And I think sometimes when we go into interviews or we even go into leadership, this is something I learned, you know, over the last 10 years, owning my own business. Sometimes I also don't have kids yet, full disclosure. Um, sometimes your employees are not going to like you. Yeah. Just like sometimes your kids don't like you because you make them eat broccoli and go to bed at eight o'clock and other things that they don't want to do. And that can sometimes be hard because I think sometimes we we associate leadership with being liked. You know, oh, my team really yeah. likes me. You must be such a good leader because your team likes you. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are for anyone who is maybe going to be stepping up into a leader position or wants to get into a leadership position. How should they think about the fact do people like me or am I liked as a leader? So I'm so glad, Kim, we're playing with these different kinds of relationship analogies. So just like with having your own kids, there's going to be times that you're going to say something they're not going to like, but you need them to understand your intention. And that's where respect comes in. It's the same thing with leadership. You got to make sure you're clear on your intention and they may not like your decision, but they'll respect your decision if they understand where your intention is. When I would teach more regularly in um, MBA programs and teach MBA students um, questions around feed, like topics around feedback, I would always ask the class the same question. Well, tell me about a time you got feedback that was meaningful and impactful to you. And I got folks who would talk about getting feedback who worked in kitchens, which is always not the nicest kind of feedback. Military, not always the nicest kind of feedback. But they'd say to me consistently, look, if the persons, if I knew they had my best interest in mind, it didn't matter how they delivered it. I knew it was really about me. So I think the key is as long as you're thinking about your employee and your team members and trying to have the best interest in mind for them and you're communicating that, even if it's a decision that is not what they want, they'll respect you. So put them first and make sure you communicate that intention. Uh, those are two great tips to start anyone on the path of being a wonderful world-class leader, not a world-class a world awful leader. No, nobody wants that. And if you're done, if you're just joining us, don't worry. There's still time to catch up. I'm talking with Brandon Smith all about leadership, overcoming leadership challenges. If you have questions, like I said before, drop them in the chat. It's an interactive conversation. You have a seat at this table as well. We we can just talk about all my questions. God knows I have a hundred, but but I want to make sure you get some questions in there too. I'm, I'm so curious, you know, as we talk about workplace culture, I, I have seen, I would love kind of your expert opinion because you're in the weeds. It seems to me that over the past 16, 17 months, especially during COVID, there's been a lot of conversations about culture and trusting your employees and working from home. Obviously, there's been an explosion and you've even recommended Brene Brown's um, TED Talks and books in some of your podcast episodes. I'm curious, is there actual change happening or is it just a lot of talk without real change? So I, I can share with you what change is, 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 has happened that I think is going to be permanent. Okay. So for, yeah. for, a, for a lot of companies, um, a lot of organizations, there was this belief that, no, we, we can't get done work, work done remotely at all. It just doesn't work. We're not going to even allow it or even try it. Well, everyone's proved that wrong. So it's, it's been a consistent win across the board that work can get done um, remotely. 
work that involves not face to face frontline work. Um, you, you know, if you work in a kitchen, you still got to go to the kitchen to do that work. But, but you know, work that can be done via our computers, kind of, yes, it can all be done remotely. So that's that part's great. So that's a win. And I think that's going to transform work going forward. So there's going to be much more of an interesting work life. I wouldn't even say balance. I would say a work life smear because it's like, it's just, it's a horrible word. I don't even like that word, but it is. It's like this, this thing because, you know, where things didn't go so well is in the beginning of, of the pandemic, everyone said, oh my gosh, I got all this found time. I'm not commuting in the morning. And, and it's like two or three extra hours in my day. And then about a month into it, everyone said, guess what? I know you're not commuting. You're available for a call at 8 a.m. or 7.30. So now people are thinking like, how am I going to balance this when we go back into the office when I actually have calls scheduled now regularly at 7.30 in the morning or all the way up until 5.30 or 6 at night? So I think people are going to have to figure out ba um, boundaries. It's another good therapist word. It's, it, it's all about setting boundaries because part of any kind of, if anyone's ever gone through therapy, I, I recommend it for everybody. Um, you know, one of the principles is always figuring out, you know, not only who we are, but how do we set boundaries in our life to protect ourselves? Well, that's absolutely true with work. And that's going to be something that we're all going to have to figure out going forward. And hopefully our managers and our leaders will help us in that process. Um, so I think that's, I think that's definitely something that is going to be changing. Now, I will say one more thing that's also changed is people have missed people. People, people have missed people. Probably one of the things is that has suffered the most in the category of just general relationship building has been play. Uh, I had a nonprofit leader and she said, you know what? Our work is really stressful. She said, we, we, we get through it by connecting with each other at work and sharing our own stories and struggles and being playful with each other. She said, over the last 12 months, we haven't done any of that connecting. We haven't been playful. So all we have is stress. That's all we've had. So we, we miss the ability to be playful and, you know, whether it's happy hours or just being playful at work. So I, I think people are hungry to get back to that. So some things we'll go back to. Some things are going to be they're a, a, a work in progress, Kim, as we, <laughs> as we deal with this like sphere of work and life. I love it. Or as Jen put it, work-life integration. You know, yeah. it's Let's, all integrated. It's all, or just all life. Yeah, yeah, it's just, exactly. It's just, all a bunch of life. And I'm curious, you know, and, and I so, so love your book title and the topic. And I think it's so timely, very timely with COVID. You're like a master marketer because <laughs> as we go back or back to normal or back, you know, whatever normal is now, whatever, back to maybe in the office or whatever, I have noticed, at least with my company and my business, that there is a huge uptick in all of a sudden urgent we're back, you know, we're back at the office, yeah. we're back in business, things are going, blah, blah, blah. and we went from like, no, zero to a hundred very, yeah. very quickly. And so I love your concept around urgency. So I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about your, your hot sauce analogy with this. Yeah. So for folks who maybe don't know about the book, the book's called the hot sauce principle, how to live and lead in a world where everything is urgent all the time. And the idea behind it really is that's the world we're living in. I mean, time's our most precious resource. It's not money. And, and everything feels urgent all the time. And so the reason why I call it the hot sauce principle is because from now on, when everyone who's listening and watching us today thinks about urgency, I want them to think about hot sauce because urgency really is hot sauce. And why I, why it's, why I like that analogy so much is that I actually love hot sauce. You know, you put a little bit of hot sauce on something, it adds focus. It adds flavor. Exactly. It's like, mwah. it's like, it's, it's, it, it really just highlights things and it makes it a priority, right? It's like, oh, that's, that's, that's hot. But if everything that comes out of the kitchen, you know, the, the appetizers, the salad, the entree, the brownie at the end, uh, I live in the South. So the, so there's an iced tea, right? Covered in hot sauce. Then you're, you know, if, if you're like me, you're going to be First of all, you won't be able to taste anything. You'll be curled up in a ball, sweating, like begging for relief. So I think so much of life is being able to recognize um, and manage and master how much urgency, how much hot sauce you're allowing to be put on your plate, but also how much hot sauce you're putting on other people's plate. 
because so often I see leaders, particularly in publicly traded companies, they just make everything urgent because there's pressure from the market. Everything's urgent all the time. They pat themselves on the back, go back to their office and say, oh, I'm a great leader. And all they've really done is go a huge injection of anxiety into the system because that's also what urgency is. It's anxiety. And using the right doses, it can be motivating. Using the wrong doses, well, we, we know about anxiety and we know that so many people are dealing with levels of anxiety we've probably never seen in society before. And it's part of this whole culture that we're in. So, so it's, it's really about managing the hot sauce in your life. And what it, if, if someone was in a position where maybe they have a hot sauce culprit on their hands, there's like someone on the marketing team, maybe it's their boss or a yeah. colleague. I would, I would even say this sometimes happens in life. Yeah. Like, you know, my cousin wants something really fast or my aunt, you know, you, you have to like oh, get yeah. something really quick. How do you, how do you set those boundaries or how do you, how do you deal with the hot sauce culprit? Yeah. Okay. So we've got, we've got hot sauce like this. So I've got a little bottle of Tabasco I'm holding up for those that might not be able to, they're listening. Um, oh, uh, these are kind, this is the kind you get from in like the hotel, right? So when we get back to the hotel buffets one day, you'll you get these. And then there's hot sauce like this. Okay. And I'm holding up a giant bottle of Tabasco. Okay, there's two different kinds. And, and so some folks just like the big bottle all the time. So let's talk about it with work first, because that's a little bit different animal than, than personal life. Um, so from now on, whenever you have a boss or a leader or a manager or someone you support, don't, I don't want anyone here to ever view her or him as your boss or leader or manager anymore. I want, to, want you to view them as your number one customer. Because when we do that, it immediately turns on in our brain customer management techniques. So then this, this, this customer has now asked for more things outside of the scope of work we've promised that, that, that we promised her or him. So when we go back to her or him and we say, oh, I, I would love to help you with that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough resources. So you either need to help me reprioritize or we can talk about getting me more resources. So you're not telling them no, but you're forcing prioritization. So that's the key because so often we don't want to turn our boss down so we say yes but over time that's going to lead to our own burnout and sacrificing ourselves and the boss may be completely unaware that that we're in that position so we need to spend a little time kind of customer or client management well i think this is you i love jen and and everybody being like hot sauce it is the best analogy ever because we all know people that are obsessed with hot sauce and and maybe use it a little, a little too much in, in, our, in our lives. And I love this idea of really making people prioritize because I think that that you're right. It, it fuels anxiety in the person who's giving the directive. It fuels anxiety in the person who's receiving the directive. And then you just have a, a workplace filled with anxiety that's super sensitive to touch. And I'm curious because I think you're in a very unique place. You know, again, for anybody that doesn't know. Brandon does a lot of consulting work and coaching work kind of inside. You're like James Bond. You're like on the inside of these really successful companies and these really successful leaders. And, and I'm curious, what is, what is a problem that you see kind of across the board? Like it's happening at the very, very top of the Fortune 500. And it's also happening in like the mom and pop store in your local town. Well, oh, naturally, urgency is one of them. I think it's... I think it's um... Urgency is definitely one. The other one that I would say is probably an issue, um, and it's tied to this. Um, and it's all in the word priorities, either unclear priorities or constantly changing priorities. So, I'll, so I'll tell I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. So, a few years ago, there's a group of researchers, and they studied this. What I think is the most fascinating question: What's the worst kind of leader to work for? Worst kind of leader. Now, I expected them to come back with the yelling, screaming, pound the fists on the table kind of leader. I expected that would be their answer. That was not number one. Micromanager was not number one. The, the, the ghosting boss you can never find, not number one. The number one worst was the highly inconsistent boss. The one who was constantly changing priorities, changing moods, maybe treating people uh, differently because you can't manage to inconsistent. So I would say part of the challenge that we're getting, whether it's Fortune 500 or it's the five-person mom-and-pop store, is, is 
either not communicating priorities or constantly changing priorities because that also creates anxiety. Um, and people can't, they don't know how to operate in that world. So uh, that would be a great kind of simple antidote and recommendation that would fix most most problems. Well, I, I feel like those changing priorities, the urgency, holding people accountable to Sarah's point, it's so important. And, but I also find one of the things that I'm personally bad at is I sometimes hold myself too accountable. And what I mean is I'm very hard on myself. You know, you should have gotten to that, you know, going back to like almost urgency with myself. Like, oh, you should have gotten 10 more tasks done this week and you didn't. So you suck. And I know on your podcast, you've talked quite a few times about self-talk. And so when we're talking about urgency and accountability, I did kind of want to hold up that that also doesn't necessarily always come from third parties. Sometimes that comes from us. Do you yeah. see that that's also something that a lot of people struggle with their, their own I guess, self-judgment? Yes. And we can get ourselves running at a pace that we think we have to keep running at. I'm guilty of this. I'm 100%, 1,000% guilty of this. Like, and I just can't, and, and my family tells me all the time, they're like, yeah, you need to, you need to calm down. It's okay. It's all right. And it's just, it's, it's kind of that, that there, there's, um, there's two things to this. There's the constant, there's the pace, right? We got to keep ourselves up. We got to always be responsive. There's value and responsiveness, by the way. It's really, really valuable, but it can be overdone just like anything. Um, and then there's also the self-talk. Now, then there's the, the the critiquing past events, which is exactly that face, Kim. If people could see that face, it's like that that sums it all up. Like there's no, there's no real value there. So I think, I think, you know, the antidote would be um, a couple things. First, you know, the goal really is progress. It doesn't matter how long it takes us to get there. So if it's two steps forward, one step back, that's okay. You know, so just remind ourselves, I'm, I'm in a different place today than I was, you know, um, six months ago. A, a, a ment one of my dearest friends in life and a mentor to me, who's a therapist and, and a coach, and, and he's given me so many wise words. He said, you know, people change is hard. People change is not like a light switch. It's a dimmer switch. He says, one, one day you'll just wake up and you'll notice, oh, I'm in a different place than I was. Um, so you got to give yourself grace around that. So it, rather than critiquing all the little decisions, look at the bigger picture. Like, am I, am I making progress? Kind of the, take a pay, take a page out of our friends in the startup world and fail fast, you know, fail fast, learn from it, make, you know, and say, Oh, that's great. I'm going to, I'm going to keep making, keep making progress. So I think, I think that's a great kind of way to hold on to that, to, to shift some of the mindset. No, I love that dimmer dimmer switch visual because it, it is so true. And I also, I love this question from Jen about how do you as an employee or a team member suggest coping with an inconsistent leader? So, so maybe someone who doesn't have a lot of self-reflection uh, in this way. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. So the, the anti, one of the antidotes to workplace dysfunction is clarity drive clarity. You can present, prevent 50% of all workplace dysfunction that's people related by being really, really clear, both on clear on your expectations, but also driving clarity on someone else's. So when a boss is inconsistent um, or maybe have some ADHD tendencies, so they don't mean to be inconsistent, but they have some of that just by the pace that they run. They like to brainstorm a lot, throw out new ideas a lot. Um, you want to put as much of what you talk about in writing and send it back to her or him and say, here's what I heard you say. Here's what I'm going to do. I just wanted to make sure this is okay with what your expectations are. So drive as much clarity as you can. Don't just sit there passively and nod your head because you didn't play back to them what they, what they said and what you heard might not be what they intended for you to hear. Um, I, I think the clear is so important. And I think also the repeating I think sometimes when people say things one time, I've also been in meetings where people say, yeah, 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 we're going to do this. And after I follow up saying, just to be clear, like, this is what you wanted. They're kind of like, oh yeah, maybe I didn't want that. So I would say it's yeah. also great because some people catch themselves uh, like maybe in a mistake or something they didn't mean to say. Yeah. And here's the other big advantage of this. So I'm also an anxious enough guy as it is, which I'm sure is the whole urgency thing I'm perpetuating in my own head. Uh, but 
um, you can prevent a lot of that stuff by because driving clarity prevents you from guessing. So, so the last thing you want to do is sit there quietly and say, well, I think this is what they want, but I don't want to ask them a question because I'll sound stupid and that would be bad. So I'll just guess. No, don't do that because there's a po- probability you're going to guess wrong. Plus you're going to be anxious the whole time. So just, you know, don't be afraid to ask a follow-up question. Um, there's so much power in questions. I think sometimes we're afraid to do that because we, we're afraid of what people are going to think about us. But it, it's all about helping you and that other party reach a clear understanding of what the path forward is. So you feel comfortable, they feel comfortable, and you deliver on their expectations every time, which is which is great. That's why it goes back to the whole idea of treat your boss like a client or customer. You know, ask those clarifying questions, uh, and then they'll always be happy. You'll always be happy, and that's that's workplace happiness. That's good. A hundred percent. I loved the quote that Jen had in the chat earlier from Brene Brown, clear is kind, because I, I do think that that's such a wonderful quote that sums it up so well. If you're just joining us, welcome. Having a great chat here with Brandon, all about leadership challenges. If you have questions or thoughts or comments, drop it in the chat. It's an interactive conversation and we would love to hear from you. When we kind of build off of clear is kind and, and providing that clarity and, and really being intentional with people. I loved a point that I heard you make on a podcast that we can only really absorb three to five values when it comes to a company or when it comes to leadership. Do you feel that being really clear on three values, you know, that people should focus on that as opposed to, I think some leaders think they need to have 10 values or, you know, 15 values and that this sort of more is better mentality. Oh, uh, three to five. Absolutely. What, what happens when we start to get to six, seven, eight plus, it's not that we forget number six or number seven or number eight. We forget them all. They, uh, it, we just forget the whole thing. We just throw them all out. So it's, you know, th- think of it this way. You have sent a team member into the grocery store and you, and, and, but there, but there's no carts and there's no baskets. And you're asking them to pick up some important items and come out with them. So they got to carry them in their arms. If you tell them to carry 10 things out, they'll come out with six, maybe, or five, or drop the whole thing. Okay. But if you tell them to bring back three or four or five, they're probably going to bring back those three, four or five. So we want less because less allows for sticky. And if we're talking about values and culture, it's all about sticky. We want them to be not only memorable, but we want people to share them with other people. So less is less is more. And can people kind of create values? You know, somebody might work at a large organization, let's call it Bank of America. And, and you know, they just have a small team within a larger Bank of America that Bank of America has their own values and their own mission statement and all that sort of stuff. Can people create their own values just within their team or, or within yes. their organization? Highly recommend it. Highly Absolutely. Recommend it. Highly recommend it. Don't just copy the val- the big corporate values and make those your team values. However, there's a caveat to this. They still need to share the same DNA. So I, I think you're getting, I'm an analogy guy. So here's another analogy. It's like, you know, you're part of that same family. So you want to make sure that you'd still be invited to Thanksgiving dinner. The, mi- the minute you and your team become the crazy aunt or uncle, it's not going to be good. So just make sure you're still sharing that same DNA. But every department's a little different. So their values need to be a little bit different. If you're a sales department, it's going to be a little more about relationships. If you're accounting, it's going to be a little more about precision and accuracy. So, you know, you want to make sure that your values fit the work that you're doing because culture is, is culture is two things. It's our identity. It's who we are, but it's also answers the question of how we get stuff done. So your culture should help you get stuff done. So that's when you think about those three to five values, it's what are the three to five values we need to be healthy and get our work done? And for accounting department, it's going to look a little different than the sales department. Absolutely. And, you know, again, you've worked with so many amazing companies and so many amazing leaders. I'd love this question from Giacomo. What are some of the most important values or maybe the most common that you see across That's leaders or across industries? That's a hard question. I don't have, so I, I can't answer Giacomo's question precisely, but I can give everyone some frameworks to answer the question in your own way. So all cultures should have a mix between operational values and relational values. 
So operational values are like quality, speed, accuracy, safety, you know, that's kind of operational values. Relational values are like care, empathy, listening, okay? So you want both. You, you tip two operationally, people don't feel like you care about them. You tip two relationally, you're not going to kind of get some of the blocking and tackling done. So when you're thinking about your three to five, pick some values from those two buckets that fit best. Um, I think that's that's one way to definitely kind of consider the question of most important values. Uh, the, the second is it needs to be words, or, if you're the leader, it needs to be words or phrases that are meaningful to you because you have to talk about it all the time. So the reason why I wouldn't want to answer Giacomo's question is, you know, I've got, I love clarity, for example, as a value. Giacomo, I'm sure likes clarity, but he may not love it the same way I do. He may love a different value. So it needs to be a value that you love because you got to talk about it all the time and you're going to have to back it up. So when people violate it, you're going to have to come in quickly and say, nope, that's not okay. We, we, we stand for this value in this department. So it has to, it has to ring true to you. But it should be some combination of operational and relational. And I'm, I'm curious for your thoughts on the fact that should values change? And what mm. I mean by that is, again, using myself as an example, I've had a company now for the last 10 years, a marketing agency. I feel like our values maybe in the first three years are very different than the values maybe we held in years seven through nine. So how often should people be revisiting values or changing values? What, what are your thoughts on that? Great question. Okay, so on my podcast a few years ago, I had a culture expert and we started talking and we came to this, I think, great analogy. Okay, so um, for folks watching, you can see I've got these glasses on. They're actually brand new, which is great because I actually went to the optometrist this year, got my eyes checked. I should be going to the optometrist every single year to get my eyes checked. I, I don't do that. I probably should. I probably go about every three years, to be honest. Um, but I at least go every three years, okay? Okay, my glasses are the lenses that I look through, okay? This is how I see the world. Our values are the lenses we look through. It's how we see the world. Our, our eyes change or the world around us changes. So we should be probably revisiting our values probably every three years. Just like going to get our eyes checked, you might need a new prescription. So every three years is a good kind of rule of thumb, unless you have some um, significant event. You know, you triple in size, you acquire another company, your customer base changes. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, you might need to go to the optometrist. Uh, but otherwise, a good rule of thumb every three years. I think that's so important for people to know that it really is a lens in which you see the world. Like you hit on that so perfectly. And when it comes to lens seeing the world, I feel like your lens is so unique because you're also doing so many different things. I mean, we've talked about your book. We just referenced your podcast. I know you're also working with clients in, in a consultant's capacity. Like, how are you doing all this? Do you have like a team of elves behind you? You know, I, I feel like you're doing so much. How are you getting everything? Oh, really good team to help me. I mean, I think that's the key. I mean, you know, so I've got a wonderful executive assistant that handles all my scheduling and keeps me booked pretty darn tight. I've got a team with who does all my production for my podcast and social media. Um, I've got a graphic artist who does all that work. So it's, I think I've learned as my capacity got smaller and smaller um, to, to find really talented, gifted folks that can help keep all those other things running. So I can focus my time on the things that, you know, only I, only I want to do and only I can do, uh, which is everything from individual coaching to working with teams to all the other stuff that you rattled off. And one thing I always ask people, because I always think this is so interesting, is do coaches have a coach? Like, do you, it's kind of sort of like inception, like you are helping others with leadership, but do you also sometimes need help with leadership? And if so, where do you go for that? Yeah. So I've got, a, I've got a business partner and um, he and I bounce things and we are both coaches. So he will challenge me on things. I'll challenge him on things. So I've got that element. I've got that mentor that I mentioned earlier that I go to for a combination of coaching and therapy. So sometimes I'll have something come up in life and I'm like, you know, there's this great line in the beginning of the movie, The Incredibles, where Mr. Incredible says, I feel like the maid. I feel like I just cleaned up this place. 
and, and, and I think that's so true with us in terms of our own personal work. We clean it up. We think it's all cleaned up. And then a year, year or five years or 10 years later, that same thing comes back again. It's like, wait a minute. I thought I did all this work. I mean, I have to go back and do it again. <laughs> um, so, like, you know, yeah. So I'll notice something will trigger something. And then I'll call Len and say, Len, I need to schedule some time for us to chat a little bit about my issues. That's so true. And I love this question from Jean, which is how do you differentiate a coach from a mentor if those are two different people in your life? Yeah. So um, a coach is, is a formal contract. So think about that as a, there, there's typically probably compensation involved in a coach with a coach and a coach it, it's set for a period of time and they're going to work with you. And there's probably some kind of underlying process and for the most part, the coach will kind of run that process, right? So the coach will say, all right, Kim, our first step is I'm going to do 360 interviews with you. And then I'm going to do all those interviews and then I'll bring back the report and then we'll talk about it and I'll create an action plan. And then we're going to coach off that action plan. Okay. The coach kind of runs all that. The, the, uh, um, the mentor mentee relationship is different. It's much more informal. Um, there's the expectation that the mentee owns that relationship. So the mentor is just going to, you know, sit there in her or his office or, or home and wait for you as the mentee to reach out if you need help. Um, and often those relationships can last years, a mentor-mentee relationship. And it can cover a lot more ground than just a particular um, leadership topic. It can talk about life. It can expand. So it has a much, so I think, I think the simple way to answer it is coaching is much more of a bounded, structured relationship. Mentor is a much more fluid, bigger a bigger um, kind of package. And I think people could probably use both, to be honest. Are you kidding me? I always say like, E, all of the above. <laughs> I want all the things. I want the coach. I want the mentors. I want the advocates. I want the advisors. Like I want all of the things. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so this question from Roger, all about, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase the question differently, but the best way to handle workload when everything has to be completed with urgency. And we sort of talked about boundaries earlier with this, Roger, but but Brandon, I'll let you take this one. Yeah. I, so again, you want to go back to um, the original giver of the work. Uh, in some cases, it's more than one. In some cases, you might have a couple different people giving you work. And, and, and that's, that's a different dynamic. So first let's talk if you have an individual who's giving you all this work, you need to go back to her, him and say, look, he, he, here's the, here's the constraints that we have either hours or number of team members or whatever happens to be. Um, and, and it, I'm willing to exceed hours this one time, but this is unsustainable. If this is the pace in which you want to operate, you know, something's going to have to give at, at some point. So you, you can have that conversation, but you want to force prioritization and see if they can give you any kind of release valve, move something to later in the year, give you more resources, whatever happens to be. Now, if it's multiple people giving it to you, in many ways, it's easier because they don't realize all the people giving you stuff. They don't really care. They just want what they want. And they, and, and so that's their, that's their orientation. So I had an MBA student years ago and she worked as an intern in an investment banking firm in New York. And she had a, a managing director give her a big project. Well, the next day, another managing director came over and gave her another big project. And she turned to him very, very politely and said, oh my gosh, I'm so happy to help you with this. I'm, I'd be thrilled to help you with this. Um, unfortunately, your, your peer just gave me this big project yesterday, but I'm happy to go tell him no, that I'm not going to help him with this because I'm going to now do your, your project for you. Is that okay if I do that? And he looked at her and he said, no, never mind. <laughs> So letting those other people who are giving all that work and, and say, look, I'll, I'm going to do this for you, but that means I'm going to go tell your peer that now I'm not doing this thing for her because I'm doing it for you instead, which will create all that political tension. Um, use that to your advantage um, because having that conversation in a very nice way will will often have them back down. They'll say, I, I, I'll just give it to somebody else. I don't want to deal with all that. It's so true. Just putting it back on other people and asking them to be clear and to provide more clarity. So succinct. Okay. We've made it to my favorite, favorite, favorite part of our chat, which is like the rapid fire caffeine filled round. This is stressful. I, sh I shouldn't feel stressed out right now. Should I? I'm, I'm no, so stressed. It's gonna like, be, where's this going to go? It's going to be so much fun. I promise. Okay, drink just of water. Rapid fire questions that are just going to kind of help us 
you're so smart and so talented and so accomplished. We basically just want to copy all of your homework. We're not in middle school anymore. We're allowed to do that. Uh, we just want to copy all of your homework and then use it for ourselves. So we appreciate well, you have, letting I, us copy I have, your homework. I have, I, have, I have messy handwriting. I don't know what to tell you. Messy hand. But let's see. Let's see what comes out. You might not. You might not want to copy it. I love it. What is something that you have started? using or doing lately that you absolutely love? It could be I'm using this new app that I really love, or I'm doing this practice that I really like. What's something that you have just been like, I want to tell all of my friends and family about this because I'm obsessed with it. So um, I have a love-hate relationship with it. So I'll caveat it that way. So I've always gone to the gym, but um, my wife convinced me to join Orange Theory Fitness which is high intensity interval training for those that might not know orange theory fitness. And it is like, I mean, it's not unusual for me to burn like 900 calories in an hour. And, and the first eight classes, like I died the first eight classes, Kim, you you know, you get a little band on your arm. You're supposed to be in the orange zone. I, I was in the red zone for eight classes, but the result of it, because it works out so many different parts of my body things, it makes me do exercises I would never do on my own that my body's in so much better shape. Like I feel so much better today than I have in I, 15, 20 years. Um, and it, it's just helped keep me loose and limber that I think commuting was causing more issues for me. So the fact that commuting went away and then I added in Orange Theory, it was like, yeah. So I'm all thumbs up on it. You've become an Orange Theory super fan. I like I, it. I, I have, I have. <laughs> Um, what is the next thing that you are hoping to learn? Could be like a language or could be a specific course you want to take. Is there something that you're really yeah. excited to learn more about? I'm embarrassed to say I am not very good at meditation and meditation. I, and I want to get better at that. Yeah. Like I really want to get better because I already talked about urgency and me having my own internal voice around that and anxiety. Well, yeah, I mean, exercise helps. You can counter energy with energy, but I can also calm those voices with meditation. So that's on my to-do list. I I am also I have also not quite mastered the art of meditation, even though everybody suggests I, it. So get, I'm, you're, you're I'm right there clear, with you. You're supposed to clear your mind, and I'm like, well, I, I got to go to the grocery store. I got like things to do tomorrow. <laughs> you know. It's like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't. And then I say to myself, you're not doing it right, which of course just makes that worse. So yeah. Me totally. I have this theory that now with, with the power of these things with, with our phone, you know, it used to be the saying that you are the summary of the five people you spend the most time with. And I like to do a little remix version, but I also think you're the summary of the five people you spend the most time with digitally as well, because now whether it's LinkedIn or Instagram or podcasts, you're also surrounded by these other humans that you are listening to and learning from. So I'm curious for you, what are some accounts or humans that you follow or listen to or learn from that just light you up? You're like, I can't wait to hear one more thing from this person. So the first thought that came to mind, um, and he's, he's written lots of books, but Malcolm Gladwell, every single time he writes a book, I'm first one to sign up for the early release because I love the fact he weaves in all these different stories to paint a picture. And I, and, and as a aspiring, always aspiring author, always trying to get better as a writer, I, I love his style. So anything he writes just gets, I always find it entertaining enlightening, And I want to, I want to be like that guy. Like I want to be like that guy. I mean, didn't he have a new book that just came out? He did. I haven't read it yet, but I've also read all of his other books. Gonna have to pick up that new one. Yeah, you need to. Uh, I'm curious, you are a podcast host. I'm always interested if people who host podcasts listen to podcasts, or if you don't want to listen to podcasts because you feel that you, I don't know, might might copy something or it might kind of poison your own podcast making creation. You know, I should say I listen to all these other podcasts, but I don't for that other reason. I really don't like, but so then what I do is I have, I, I, I've got my team and I always tell them, I always ask them, so what are you listening to? Like, tell me what you like, what are things that you're learning in terms of how other people are hosting shows? 
um, because I still want to stay really, really true to my own style. Um, and so I'm always making changes to my show and, tw and tweaking things to make it better. Like I made some changes this year, but I don't listen to a lot of other podcasts on a regular basis. Now I do listen to podcasts, but I bounce around a lot. So I'll listen to those three there, three here, five there, 10 here, six there. If you could give a piece of advice, kind of goes off of Jose's question here a little bit. If you could give a piece of advice that you really feel like is universal global leadership advice. So it could work in Brazil, it could work in the UK, it could work in America. Is there such a thing as sort of a, a golden principle or golden piece of advice that could work no matter wherever you are in the world? Yeah. So I'll add, um, I'll reinforce one that I said earlier and then I'll add a new one. Okay. So the one earlier was clear expectations. Just be clear on your expectations, priorities. You can prevent 50% of dysfunction that way. Some cultures um, are more blunt in that way than others, but everybody needs clear expectations. Otherwise, you're asking people to guess, and that's frustrating. The other one I would add, though, um, if I go wave the magic wand and change about how workplaces kind of operate, particularly with managers, when you have one-on-ones with team members, Use those as coaching conversations, not firefighting conversations. So we always say we're going to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations and make them development. We're going to talk about, oh, how, where do you want to grow and how can I help you? And that's always the intent, but that never happens. The person comes in with a fire and they end up becoming firefighting all the time. So, the, so when our people feel poured into and developed, it, even if we aren't paying them the most or they have other opportunities somewhere else, they will stay. And they will, because they want a place to grow. And that's true across every single culture. We all, you know, you've, we've all heard the old adage, people leave managers, not companies. So be the manager that, that cares about your people enough to, to make that time for them and really focus on their growth. Uh, if you make that a priority, that, that works across every culture. I love that. And it's so, I know it would work on me <laughs> for sure. Um, okay. Last question. If you could give us all a homework assignment. So one thing that we had to do this week or try this mm -hmm. week or read this week or listen to this week or whatever it is this week yep. that would help us become better leaders. What would that one thing be? It's going to tie into things like boundaries, urgency, all the stuff we've talked about from now on, never, ever, 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 ever send an email on the weekends. Never. You can do work. And if you use like Microsoft Outlook has a wonderful um, tool where you can actually schedule emails. So I, I do work. I schedule them all to drop at 8 a.m. on Monday morning. Um, fortunately, they're not all the same person. No one would want that either. Okay. But, but I don't send them on the weekends because when we send them on the weekends, we end up getting caught up in an email tennis match. You send it to somebody. Well, they're working. So they send it back. And you send it back, they send it back, you send it back, they send it back, and now you're playing tennis and you're working versus versus what the intent of that is, which is to get caught up. And if you're the manager and you're working on the weekends like that, even if you tell your team not to copy you, you're sending the message, they should be working on the weekends. So if we can just take that simple rule, simple rule, no emails on the weekends or texts or direct messages or any other form of communication to your team, you're going to be setting boundaries for them, for yourself. It's going to help with urgency and it's going to actually allow you to prepare for the week. I love that. It's a rule that I started following a couple of years ago and I can safely say you're so right. It changed the game for me, my business, my team, our vendors, our clients that we work with. It's, it's a huge game changer. Brandon, where can people keep learning from you, following you, where do you hang out? Where can they keep getting nuggets of your wisdom? Well, I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere from Instagram to Facebook to LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, but the simplest way, if, if you want to just go to one central place, just Google the workplace therapist. Uh, believe it or not, I'm the only one. So you'll, you'll, you'll find me right away. And then, you know, all the other um, kind of resources, blogs, podcasts you can you can find that way uh, and of course my my uh, podcast the workplace therapist show is is on places where all podcasts are available so you can find it there too i love that well thank you so so much for joining us today if you guys missed this 
don't worry, there'll be a replay. You can catch up on any sections that you missed. We're also taking diligent notes for you. So we will add in some notes and you can always revisit this conversation. But Brandon, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jim, thank you, thank you. Jim, and this I was a blast. I, I, I love this. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. Thank you, everybody. Sending a big cheers to you. Have a great rest of the week.